there, let's get all started. Good morning. I want to welcome you to our Good Friday service. I invite you to join us in standing as we worship together. Lord God, we come into this place today to worship you. We come into this place on this Good Friday to recognize the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Lord, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that was accomplished through the work of Christ on the cross. And Lord, we, we come this morning in somewhat somber hearts knowing what you did for us but we also come with thankful hearts of worship because you have loved us so much that you were willing to. Lord, I pray that this time we spend together would be our worship and our thanksgiving and our praise unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to welcome you to our service this morning. And as we continue to reflect on what the Lord Jesus did and we continue to worship through song and through preparations for taking part in the Lord's table. I invite you just to, to reflect on this day and reflect on our Lord and how much he loves us.
I'm going to read Luke 23, verses 26 to 49, and I'm reading from the message. As they led him off, they made Simon, a man from Cyrene, who happened to be coming in from the countryside, carry the cross behind Jesus. A huge crowd of people followed, along with women weeping and carrying on. At one point, Jesus turned to the women and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves and for your children. The time is coming when they'll say, Lucky the women who never conceived. Lucky the wombs that never gave birth. Lucky the breasts that never gave milk. Then they'll start calling to the mountains, fall down on us, calling to the hills, cover us up. If people do these things to a live green tree, can you imagine what they'll do with dead wood? Two others, both criminals, were taken along with him for execution. When they got to the place called Skull Hill, they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Dividing up his clothes, they threw dice for them. The people stood there staring at Jesus, and the ringleaders made faces taunting. He saved others. Let's see him save himself. The Messiah of God, ha. Huh? The Chosen, ha. Huh? The soldiers also came up and poked fun at him, making a game of it. They toasted him with sour wine. So you're king of the Jews. Save yourself. Printed over him was a sign, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging alongside cursed him, some Messiah you are, save yourself, save us. But the other one made him shut up. Have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. He said, don't worry, I will. Today you will join me in paradise. By now it was noon. The whole earth became dark, the darkness lasting three hours, a total blackout. The temple curtain split right down the middle. Jesus called loudly, Father, I place my life in your hands. Then he breathed his last. When the captain there saw what happened, he honored God. This man was innocent, a good man and innocent. All who had come around as spectators to watch the show, when they saw what actually happened, were overcome with grief and headed home. Those who knew Jesus well, along with the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a respectful distance and kept vigil. You may be seated. Well, I am glad that I am a New Testament pastor and not an Old Testament priest. I mean, it is true that sometimes pastors walk with people through some of the worst of life, and yes, as pastors, we hear stuff that, that sticks with us, but it's not overly visual. There are not many sights or odors, or you don't literally get your hands dirty. Um, not the same as when I worked in EMS. I'm not schemish, but the work I do as a pastor, it's, it, it's not as hands-on. But to be an Old Testament priest was very different. They were, yes, responsible to teach God's Word and draw people close to God, but they were also responsible to walk people through something called atonement in a very hands-on kind of way, through something that was called a sin offering that was literally an offering sacrifice to God. Leviticus chapter 1 to 9, those of you who have read in your Bible, that's often a set of 
chapters that you read through very quickly and you go, there are all these details regarding the sacrifices, the economic system of the time was, was not monetary like ours, it, it was livestock and it was, uh, it was grains and wheats and that. And the sacrifices were based off of those. Now, atonement, it's a religious word. It's a theology word. It means to satisfy a grievance, a wrong, or an injury. To make payment for an infraction to justice. For instance, an, uh, 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 someone who breaks the law will atone for their crime. Our sin, according to the Bible, our sin, the way that we live life that violates the holiness of God, doing life our own way without consideration of who God is and His ways, our sin has a consequence and requires atonement to make it right. Justice always requires a wage to be paid. And so the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. A physical death, spiritual death that we experience as a consequence. Now separation from God shouldn't surprise us. On the cross we see this in Jesus as he cried out, um, cried out to the Father about being forsaken. Eli, Eli, lama sabathamai, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's a separation that takes place in our lives as a result of sin. And this shouldn't surprise us because that is really the essence of what sin is asking for. Sin is doing life separate from God. It is asking to be separate from God. And so we should not be surprised that that is where it leads. We desire through sin to be separate from God, and God separates himself from our sin. As we say, let's do life on our own. This is all of us, the Bible teaches. For we read in the book of Romans, for all have sinned. That's you, that's me, and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, atonement, this is the pathway back. Atonement is the pathway back. Our sins must be atoned for if we are to bridge the separation between us and God. Now, we try many ways to do it ourselves. We try it through our good works. We try to make up for it. We try to trade our goodness to make up for sin. And we look at it in a way that if, if, if there's more good than bad, as long as my final ledger is on the plus side, all is good. I will try and trade my goodness, my good works, for the places where I have sinned. And as long as I come up on top, I should be good. But that is not how God works. The prophet Isaiah writes this, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like a wind, our sins sweep us away. Dear people, we cannot atone for our sins because sin has broken us. When we separate ourselves from God through sin, we break. And we no longer have the capacity or the ability to actually make it right. Only a holy and sinless sacrifice can make this right. And there is only one who is truly holy, and that is God himself. God himself, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, God in flesh, was the only one who could provide atonement for our sins. 
Only God can provide. Only God has the capacity to make things right in our lives. And in God's atonement, both his justice and his love meet. Sin requires a response. Sin requires justice. And justice is, justice is always fair. Justice is always right in God. There's a consequence, a result. But in the atonement of Jesus, both the justice of God, the consequence of sin, is met with the love of God. For we no longer have to pay the price that sin requires to bridge the separation between ourselves and God. We're not capable of doing it. So God did it for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish. The consequence of justice. But instead, Jesus absorbed this in himself. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible is clear that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And this started in the Old Testament, was foreshadowed with all different, different offerings in the Old Testament that foreshadowed what was to come to help us recognize that there was only one sacrifice that could permanently deal with the issue of sin. And that is in Jesus Started in the Old Testament, God was foreshadowing what was to come in Jesus, and he introduced atonement through the Old Testament priest. When somebody sinned, a sin offering needed to be made. There was a bull or a goat or a lamb, and it was brought to the priest. And you would lay your hand upon the head of the animal, and the animal would die on behalf of your sin. Leviticus 1.5 says this, He shall lay his hands on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Now you look at that and you say, that's not fair. And you're right, it's not. That was the point. That was the point. Leviticus 9, 7, then Moses said to Aaron, draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and for the people and bring the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord had commanded. They would do this for themselves and for all the people over and over again. The thing about the Old Testament sin offerings for atonement, the thing about them is they were really only good for one sin at a time. They're only good for one season at a time. There would be something you would recognize, you'd break one of the commandments of God, and you'd recognize the consequence for that is death. Physical, spiritual, I mean, we're all going to die. That's the consequences of Adam and Eve in the garden. None of us gets to escape this life alive. But what happens next? The Old Testament priests would take these offerings and over and over again. I mean, it could be you, you could have blown it in the parking lot after you'd given your offering and already you're in the parking lot going, wait a minute, i got to go back again. I mean, after that guy cut me off and, you know, the way I responded to it, I recognized that that's not, that's not of God. I'd really, okay, let me go to the back of the line and find another sheep. Over and over and over again. Now imagine that job being the Old Testament priest, day after day, person after person, sin after sin, starting with their own. They would remove the hides, they would separate the organs and fat, they would sprinkle and pour blood over certain places. No latex gloves. The smell, the flies, the hot, humid Middle Eastern sun. I mean, I've never worked in a meat packing plant, and I have no desire to. 
Author John Fisher, in one of my favorite books on the, on, on the Easter season called On a Hill Too Far Away, he writes this, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. See, they could only cover it up for a little while. These offerings were temporary. Annual reminders and regular reminders that only covered over sin and never truly took it away. <clears throat> the author writes, Do you think that at some point that they, the priests, might have raised their sticky, stained hands to the heavens and shouted over the moos and the bleedings, Will you people please stop all this sinning? The New Testament talks about this in Hebrews chapter 10. Starting in verse 11, it says this, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. One came to change all that. There was a final sacrifice. What the priest did had to be repeated over and over and over again. But in Christ, there was a final sacrifice. We read in Hebrews 10, 14, For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And this was Christ. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. We come to Good Friday this morning. We come to Good Friday and we really, we come to a story of atonement. We couldn't do it. And in the Old Testament, the priests, what they did was only a temporary covering. But what Jesus did was once and for all. What Jesus did was final. In him we get to leave sin and guilt behind and have a fresh start. There's something new, there's something complete that is found in Jesus Christ and is found in nowhere else. Yes, Good Friday we talk about sin. And maybe sometimes, as I thought about it this week, we, we have the wrong focus. Maybe we come to Good Friday and we try to feel bad again. Say, oh, wait a minute. Today we're going to talk about, about sin and the sacrifice of Jesus. I should feel bad again about my sin. That stuff that Jesus died on the cross for. But I was thinking about it. I think maybe that emphasis isn't quite right. Because what Jesus did was intended to be a once and for all, a final sacrifice for sin. And as we come to Good Friday, the focus isn't first on the fact that we have had sin. The focus is first and foremost on what Jesus did and the completed work of the cross. That we can look to God and no longer live and no longer feel like we need to make penance. And make things right by over and over again rehearsing what we can never change. But to recognize that even though we cannot change what we wish never happened. The cross of Christ is bigger than any of it that ever took place. See, I'm not convinced that the focus of Good Friday is to feel bad because of our sin. Because where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Perhaps the focus should be on our celebration and thanksgiving of the fact that we are free. That we are forgiven and free because of the completed work of Christ on the cross. No longer do we live under condemnation? Our sin has been atoned for in the cross. No longer. As it says in Romans 8.1, there is no longer any condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no longer regular confession that is needed. Not for the sake of forgiveness and judgment. Some of you will say, well, pastor, you preached about confession recently for believers. And yes, there is a place for Christians to be involved in confession. But for Christians, confession is about restoring trust and resetting direction. Before we come to Christ, our initial confession is about, God, forgive me. Forgive my sin. I accept the gift of your atonement into my life. Now make me the person you want me to be. After that confession of faith, we move forward as transformed people, new in the love of Christ, to become new. Not to confess our need for Christ and expect that life will be the same, but to confess Christ, to thank Him for the work of the cross, and let the power of the Spirit of God now within us transform us, that we might bring glory to God, motivated by love and gratitude for God. The Christian may still sin sometimes, they may still need to confess, but the need for confession for the believers is to restore trust and to reset direction. Not because we're afraid that now Christ's death is no longer enough. There's no regular confession needed. We do not have to return to our sins time and time again to be forgiven out of fear that God stops accepting us. There is no penance for us to make because Christ already paid it. That is the gift of atonement. Dear people, what Christ did was once and for all, for your life, for all time, it is a gift of grace, and God will never take it away from you. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are we saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift. It is the gift. It is the gift of God, so that no one can boast. But dear people, like any gift, it must be received. Like any gift that is offered to us, it must be received. A gift can be given, but we do not necessarily receive it. The atonement of Christ is a gift for us, that we may know forgiveness and become a child of God, be made new in Him and have this new life. And it can be sitting there, and yet we have not received the gift. For by grace are you saved through faith that is not of yourself. It is a gift of God. But let me ask you, dear people, have you received it? It's like the gift is under the tree with our name on it. Forgiveness, grace, and new life. But will we pick it up? Will we receive it? Will we unwrap it? Or will we enjoy it? Because it is not yours just because you are looking at it. You have to receive it. You have to receive it. We read in the Gospel of John, but to all who did receive Jesus, received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. To whom? To those who received him. Sometimes I think as Christians we forget this still. Sometimes we forget. We have to receive. We have to live in a posture of receiving that grace. And not just look at it from a distance and say, I know it's there, but I'm not actually applying it to my life. See, we're not Christians just because we believe a certain truth about Jesus. We're not even Christians because we believe in the atonement of Jesus. Our belief must be a belief that receives this grace and the new life that follows. As I said, sometimes even as Christians, I think we forget to stand within that grace that we have received. And we return again to trying to atone for ourselves. We've received grace. We've received Jesus into our life. But now we've got to prove that we're worth it. And Jesus said, you're not worth it based on what you do. You're worth it based on the fact I love you. That is where your value comes from. 
Maybe that's one of the reasons Jesus regularly invites us to his table of grace, the communion table. Maybe that's one of the reasons he invites us to this table and says, do this in remembrance of me. And maybe as we come to this table today, we need to be reminded again what it is to receive and then stand within that grace and not just look at it from afar. Colossians chapter 2 says, So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, continue to live in Him. The way you receive that grace, continue. Continue. This morning, we're going to come to the communion table. And I'm going to invite you to come to it in a different way this morning. I'm going to invite you to actually come to the table. There are many postures that are part of worship in the Bible. Sometimes we stand, sometimes we clap, sometimes we kneel, sometimes we raise hands. Physical postures sometimes help us in getting it. And this morning, as we consider the atonement that trustfully we have received, the grace that we have received, I want to invite you this morning to a posture that approaches the table receive grace. The gift is under the tree. Will I take it? Or will I just look at it from afar? This morning I want you to remember what it is to receive grace and not just look at it from a distance. So I want you to come to the table to pick up the elements. They're not going to be passed out. And then return to your seat and partake on your own. We're simply going to sing some songs of worship um, with music up here. And there is no pressure. The table is symbolic. But I want to invite you to come to the table. To take of the bread, which represents the body that is broken for you. To take of the grape juice that represents the blood of Jesus for you. To take it back to your seat and receive it. I want us to understand the table is for those who have received. It is a remembrance. And so as a remembrance, it's something that's taken place in our life already. Perhaps as you're sitting here this morning, um, you have never received God's grace. <coughs> Perhaps this morning you have never received God's grace. You've only looked at it from a distance. I want to invite you to that this morning. Taking communion does not make you a Christian. Taking communion is something that Christians do. But when we begin with a posture of, of seeing God's invitation, it may be this morning that you have yet to receive the atonement of Christ into your own life. That you know Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but you actually haven't taken the gift and applied it. Now the words are not magical. And it's not the prayer itself that makes one a Christian. It's merely the avenue, the vehicle that expresses what's in our heart. But we might pray, pray something like, Dear Jesus, thank you for making it possible for me to find peace with God. I believe that when you died on the cross, you were paying the penalty for my sins. And that because of this, I can be forgiven and become a child of God. I now receive your grace. Come into my life and lead me to be the person that you created me to be. I choose now to follow you in Jesus' name. You don't have to get the words right. It's the desire to say, Lord, I need what the cross is all about. Come into my life. If you've done that in the past, you don't have to do it again. You might have to be reminded of it from time to time, but you don't have to do it again. You're a child of God. But if that's something you have never done, then I want to invite you to do that today. Just in the quietness of where you are, to pray and say, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Come into my life. I want to follow you. Make me who you want me to be. In that moment, that expression of faith, you become a child of God. And the atonement is applied to your life. It isn't applied because you've looked at it from afar. It's applied when you receive it. If you do that, this table is open for you.
Some of you might say, that's a little uncomfortable for me. I've come from churches where you have to do things a lot differently. I've heard of churches where you have to get interviewed by the elders before you can take communion, where you have to do this and you have to do that. And the longer that I'm a pastor and the longer I'm a Christian, the more, the more that bothers me. Because the basis of coming to Jesus is not that we have proven that it has taken. The basis of coming to Jesus is that we hear his voice say, come to me, and we do it. We come. This table is not meant to be a table of restriction, a table of exclusion. It's not to be a table that says, you got to be enough. You've got to prove it first. That's not the point of this table. This table is to remind you of the cross and the love of Christ and the grace that you have received and recognize that no matter what's going on in your life, you can come to Jesus. You can come back to Jesus. Doesn't mean you can expect to live life the same way going forward. But his invitation for you is come. Come to my table and enjoy fellowship with me. Enjoy the joy and laughter of the gracious table of God. To all of us here this morning, Jesus has atoned for us. His invitation is not harsh. He wants us to live within his grace. No, our life won't be the same. It shouldn't be. Because grace should charm us to be all that God calls us to be. We should be willing to let God change us in response to his grace. But we're not to be just observers. We need to be people who receive. So that's what I invite you to do. I'm going to ask those on the music team if they would come forward. We're just going to play some songs. And if at any point while we're singing, you decide you want to partake of the Lord's table, then I invite you just to come up, take a piece of the bread, take some of the juice, and take it back to your seat. And in the quietness of your own heart, receive that which represents what Jesus did for you on the cross. Receive the grace that comes. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When you are ready, come, worship, and remember this body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Come and remember this Good Friday, and remember once again what it is to receive God's grace. Lord Jesus, as we continue to worship you this Good Friday morning, we worship you around your table. This table of grace in which you said for us to uh, take and receive. Lord, this bread which represents your body, which was broken for us to provide atonement for our sins. And Lord, this juice that represents your blood that was for us, which opens a new way of relating to you not based upon good works or bad works that, that we can't measure up to anyways, but based upon the work of Jesus on the cross, that you would relate to us now by putting your spirit within us and draw us more and more into a life that is in tune to you. Lord, I pray this morning that as we worship you through the Lord's table, you would be glorified and that we would know the joy of what it is. That even though these are just symbols, Lord, there's nothing nothing special in the bread and the juice itself. They re represent, Lord, our heart's desire as we partake to experience and to live within the grace that you have given. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for opening the way that satisfies both your justice 
and speak so profoundly of your love for us. Thank you, Lord, that as we look to this table and the cross, we know that we are wanted, and we are wanted and loved by you. In Jesus' name. You can sit, you can stand, you can kneel, whatever posture suits you in prayer. Kill far away, stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. This peace is broken and scattered mercy God.
Just as I am without a plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to be whose blood can cleanse each thought, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because I As I am, thy love unknown hath broken every barrier down, down to be thine, yes, thine alone, O lands of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, findings and fears with me.
Just as I am, poor wretch and blind, thy riches he. We close this time of worship this morning. We invite you to join us in standing as we finish with Jesus Messiah.
Lord God, we thank you for this time we could spend in your presence, worshiping you and celebrating the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, I thank you for the, the atonement that we have received through the work of Jesus on the cross that has opened the way for us to have forgiveness and grace and to live a new life. 
in him. I pray, Lord, that that is a gift that we will have each received. I pray, Lord, that, that we would look to you and not to ourselves as a source of all right, righteousness, a source of all uh, value. Thank you that you loved us so much that you did this. Thank you that we are wanted by you, that we are known by you. I pray, Lord, that as we go from here, we recognize the cross and we recognize the, the death that was a part of that, the sacrifice for our sins. But we look forward to what is going to come on the third day. And Lord, as we leave this place today, thanking you for the cross, we do so looking forward with anticipation to the empty tomb. For not only did the cross demonstrate your love and the power of God to save us, but the, cross, but the empty tomb speaks to us, Lord, of your power to change us. Lord, we commit ourselves to you as we leave here, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord dismisses you. You are dismissed. Thank you so much.